My name is Dr. Fatima Sanchez Nieto. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I've worked with Tina before, and I am very happy that I get to, um, to be with you today and to collaborate with her as well. Uh, if you all need to reach me, uh, you can reach me through ProtonMail. That is an encrypted uh, email service, uh, and the email will be added in the chat. And these are my uh, groups, the folks that I'm associated with. On the right, you see Future of Research. That is a nonprofit organization that I'm the president of, and as Tina mentioned, um, work on the um, advocacy work around uh, early career researchers in academic training environments. So uh, all the way from grad school uh, through junior faculty. But as part of my day job, I am part of the uh, UW-Madison Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, as well as the Center for Improved Mentorship Experiences in Research, where we really look at and research from an evidence-based perspective the way that we can improve mentoring, um, uh, mentoring and superv supervisory relationships for grad students uh, and postdocs and junior faculty. So some of what you will hear me talk about today um, has a little bit of an academic spin, uh, but I have tried to make it as broad as possible. And there is no reason why a lot of these skills and techniques can't be applied uh, in your own life or in your own career. In fact, a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about today have originally been taken from um, the world of um, business and then adapted to academia. And so um, they, they, it, it goes both ways. Before I get started, um, I'd like to do um, a land acknowledgement, and I don't just like to do a land acknowledgement and then leave it at that. I encourage you all um, to research um, and look into which uh, traditional uh, lands you are on. Uh, UW-Madison uh, is a land-grant university. If you're not familiar with those, I encourage you to uh, research the history of land-grant universities. Um, UW-Madison itself, the campus stands on what the Ho-Chunk uh, knew as Dijop or Four Lakes, and it's a land that was colonized and forcibly taken from the Ho-Chunk. And to this day, neither UW-Madison leadership nor the state of Wisconsin have developed nor committed to giving the land nor the material benefits derived from it back to the descendants of its original inhabitants. And this is a theme that um, I think we're seeing a lot now as, as uh, land acknowledgments become more and more common. There isn't a plan beyond that. And so I encourage you all to research um, what Native scholars, Native historians, uh, folks um, who are Native themselves are saying with regards to land acknowledgments and what it is that um, Natives to this land are asking for when it comes to actionable um, advocacy uh, from leadership, both governmental as well as um, uh, administrative in this case for, for universities. Tina asked me to talk to you a little bit about my own career trajectory. Um, it's been a bit of a wild ride. If you see me looking over here, I've got my slides over here and you're over here. So um, I'm going to be moving back and forth. Um, but this, this is from a paper that I really like that studied the career trajectory of people in academia um, as far as what it is that they wanted to do. And so you, each of those horizontal lines represents a career track that people were interested at different stages in their career, and then what it is that they did after graduating. And as you can see, it was a really sort of wibbly wobbly trajectory for most folks in figuring out what it is that they wanted to do and where it is that they wanted to go. I don't need you to grasp sort of the details of this graph, but more so to say that um, career trajectories are messy and they're not always linear, like uh, the way that they are painted to us. Sometimes in hindsight, it's easy to say, oh yeah, A led to B, led to C. That's not necessarily how career trajectories work, especially once where you are exploring paths that feel uh, right to you and that are aligned with your values. Um, as well as with the opportunities that you have available to you, depending on where you live and life situations. Um, and so career trajectories are messy. I started my uh, PhD in biomedical sciences, studying stem cell research. Um, my entire PhD was based on the development of blood stem cells and how they developed in the body and how we could recreate that in, in a lab so that we could then treat um, different uh, genetic disorders that, uh, that, are, that develop in the bone marrow. Um, 
And it was about two or three years into my PhD that I started to get um, frustrated per se um, with the way that people in the academy were being treated, particularly trainees. And trainees that were colleagues of mine um, that like me did not fit into the category that uh, most people saw as culturally acceptable uh, in the academy, i.e. Um, you know, white, uh, able-bodied, cisgendered, um, heterosexual. And so I got really, really interested um, and involved in advocacy work, really looking at more holistic ways to train people. Organizational psychology became kind of my side hobby and research. Um, and I started to get really engaged in, in advocacy. Um, I don't particularly have too much time today because I want us to be interactive, um, to talk so much about my, um, my, my entire career trajectory. But if you're interested, I did give a TEDx talk two years ago now. Um, and that uh, Tina's going to do the, the favor. Um, uh, she's going to do me the favor of putting the link to that in the chat. Uh, so that you all can access that, can see it at your own uh, leisure, if you'd like to um, just see um, a little bit more about me and my career and how it is that I've gotten here. But all of this to say is that it was never um, a linear path. It's still changing from one place to the other. And at the heart of it for me has always been, is my career aligned with my values and what it is that I want to do? And that is for me specifically, ask questions um, help people and uh, and solve problems. And those are those are sort of the, the guiding values that have driven me from a career in the biomedical sciences, more into the academic, um, educational and social sciences uh, spaces, which is where I currently am now. And so my career is sort of based around three domains. Um, I've, I've given you hints about it in, in the last slide, but most of my work centers around um, how we can make academia and specifically the relationships between a mentor and a mentee, right? Um, better, more rich, more fulfilling. And that's a, a bit what we're going to talk about right now, because as I mentioned, a lot of the literature actually started, um, a lot of the literature on mentorship, I should say, started in the business space uh, and was then transferred over into um, the academic space uh, with the work that I do. But that research itself and, and the work that I do really for me um, isn't worth much if we're not actually applying and implementing those changes to really lead towards better training space. There we go. You can continue, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, there's always tech things that, that come up. So as I was saying, for me, um, the importance of the research or the value of the research is only um, is, is correlated to really how we're applying that research and how we're impacting people's lives. And so my advocacy work through future research is really informed by research and, evi and evidence base of collecting data on the um, status of how early career researchers are going through their, their training programs in academia. Um, but then the research itself, it not just informs the advocacy, but the advocacy also informs the research. In other words, I ask questions that can uh, lead to answers that then inform interventions and solutions to make um, a better training environments, better training conditions, and better training relationships. And that's where my work with UW-Madison um, comes in, where we're really integrating the research, i.e. what makes good mentoring relationships, into interventions. And what I mean by interventions are trainings that we give to trainees as well as to mentors to say, okay, you're put in this um, in this relationship, right? The supervisory mentory relationship. You're not really taught when you're taught to be a scientist or when you're taught to be a, a you know, someone who is in the world of engineering or math. You're not really taught how to develop relationships that support the people that are that you're going to be managing. So how can we teach you to be a better manager? And on the flip side, what we teach the trainees is how can we empower you to get the most out of your mentorship relationships so that you can truly uh, thrive and succeed in your in your own careers. And that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. This is sort of my segue from my own career into uh, the work um, and the learning that that we're hopefully going to be doing today and giving you some skills that you 
you can take with you and apply to your own career. So the first thing to ask is, um, what is mentorship? There is a lot of definitions out there, and there are a lot of ideas and opinions out there as to what mentorship should or should not be. One of the great things about uh, working with scientists is that they like definitions and they like research. And so a few years, both of my supervisors uh, at the time were invited to be on a panel by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. The report is 300 pages long. I don't, um, I, we, we're going to link it in the chat. Don't feel like you need to go through all 300 pages to learn about mentorship. That's really, if you're like me, a researcher of mentorship. Um, but the summary is only eight pages long, and it provides a really concrete um, sort of definition and examples and um, ideas for folks, uh, particularly, again, in the sort of management and, and um, uh, leadership side of things in academia. Um, but the definition that they came up with, so if ever someone's like, to you, oh, but what even is mentorship? No one knows, everyone has different definitions. You can say, well, actually, um, a few experts got together, um, you know, two or three years ago, and they came up with a consensus definition for what mentorship is. I'm not gonna read it. Um, these slides we can uh, make available to you afterwards. I'll send them over to, to Tina. Um, but the important things that I want you to get out of this definition of mentorship, one is that it's a working alliance. Um, mentorship as, as a relationship needs to be bi-directional. Um, it needs to be uh, an alliance and both parties need to see the benefit of the relationship and want to put intentional work into the relationship. Just like any other relationship, it takes two people or in the case of mentorship networks that we're gonna talk about um, in the next slide more, uh, but it takes intentional work and effort from all parties involved. So this isn't something where the mentor can just step aside and not do any work. And likewise, it's not something that um, the mentee needs to just expect, you know, the mentor to, to be doing all the teaching and all the, all the um, sort of giving to this relationship. Um, so it's people working together, bi-directional. The other important piece that I want you all to, to take away from this is that it includes career and psychosocial support. Now, career support is always obvious to people. They're like, oh, yeah, my mentor, you know, they support me whenever I uh, go to a conference or I wanted to get a better salary and they put me up for promotion or, you know, there was an issue in the workplace and my mentor helped um, resolve it or, or helped be a sounding board to come up with solutions. Those pieces feel a little bit more normal, I should say, or natural than the psychosocial aspect, which especially in the sciences, people tend to be a little bit afraid of. Um, what do we mean by psychosocial support? It's not that your mentor um, is going to be your therapist because that's not their job, but your mentor is someone who is going to sit with you when you're really struggling with um, a, a career decision or with a life decision or when your life is interfering with your work and they're going to sit with you and listen to you and support you through some of the emotional aspects of this um, from the position of being someone who is in power and who could potentially support you. Um, so sometimes mentorship relationships are formal. Sometimes they arise a little bit more informally. We're going to talk about those, those distinctions as well. But the important thing to get here is that you're talking about a bi-directional uh, relationship really, including both aspects of career and psychosocial support that can be formal or informal. Um, and in the cases of formal mentorship relationships uh, in places like academia or uh, your career, where, where those relationships are formal and established, then power dynamics do have to be taken into account and talked about openly um, in the sense of Yes, we're coming together to talk about my career as equals, and yet we also have to contend with the fact that you as my boss, my manager, my supervisor, um, have needs uh, and, and, and wants for, for your own um, sort of career and your own role that may at sometimes uh, feel like they are in conflict with, with my own career um, goals and needs and wants. So those things have to have to be reckoned with for sure. Um, and, and again, we can talk about some of that in, in a second. So establishing mentorship relationships, we know now what mentorship is. We know that there's literature out there that says mentorship relationships are great for people. 
um, let's go ahead and start a, a mentorship relationship. The important thing to note from, from this slide, and this is also from that report that, that I mentioned, um, is that the traditional mentor-mentee relationship is that dyad you see in A, where usually those are considered to be, you know, one mentor and one mentee. But really what the research is starting to show is that one mentor can't for, fulfill um, all of your roles. And that's that's common sense, right? You're, you're not going to have a mentor that's going to be able to support you in every single aspect of every single piece of your life and career stage. Um, your needs as a uh, professional, your needs as a scientist, your needs as an advocate, uh, your needs as a human being are going to evolve with time and as you progress through your career. And so the most successful net, uh, mentorship relationships are those that um, where the mentee recognizes that there is the power, um, there is power in collective mentorship and reaches out and has a network of both informal and formal mentors who can address all of these different mentorship needs. So what are my mentorship needs, you might ask? I've never thought about my mentorship needs. How do I even begin to think about what my mentorship needs are? Um, and that is the perfect segue into um, our next activity. So we're actually going to go into breakout groups. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, in, in a second. Uh, so now you can all see me. You'll be able to see each other in a second. We're going to go off into breakout groups of about five people. Um, some of us will be jumping between groups just to make sure that you all understand what, what we're doing and, and keeping on track. There's a worksheet that I'm going to ask you to look through. They list out some of the common mentorship needs that we and our team have um, developed or discovered with, within our research. Just look through that. Um, briefly introduce yourself to the, to the team. Uh, in your small groups, sorry, briefly do an introduction, and then look through that list and just pick out the three that feel most important to you. Um, we'll only have like five, seven minutes uh, for, for the breakout group. Um, so I really want you to get at that, that important piece, which of those three stand out, because sometimes we have a lot of mentorship needs, um, but we really want to get at prioritizing which ones are the ones that we need um, right now. Um, if you get past the picking of the three and discussing that with your group, there's some few questions there on the worksheet too that you can look at and discuss. Um, but take a few minutes um, to, again, get to know each other. Say, just say hi briefly um, and then uh, look at this worksheet and pick three uh, of the mentorship needs that that feel most salient to you right now in your career. And we'll come back at the half hour mark and then spend like five minutes discussing. So Tina or uh, Renee or Lutrina, whoever's um, doing breakout groups, if you could send us out to breakout groups now, that would be fantastic. Yep, so I shared the Google Doc uh, in the chat. So make sure you click on that. Um, and I'm going to open rooms now. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, it looks like I have to assign people. <laughs> so I will oh. just randomly yeah you can just randomly assign when you create the the groups but folks as you're getting assigned please feel free to join the groups oops
Tina, I'm going to pause the recording while you put people in breakout groups. Everyone, we'll just wait for folks to um, start coming back from the breakout groups. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming back. Um, apologies for those um, tech uh, difficulties. They they seem to always pop up uh, inevitably and when we least expect them. Were there any folks who want to share some insights that came from just looking at that sheet and discussing with other folks in terms of mentorship needs? Anything interesting? Anything that you felt was new or innovative that you hadn't thought of before that you'd like to share with the larger group? Uh, Unius, I see you uh, came unmuted, but we can't hear you. Uh, okay, um, I think for um, um, my break room, for the guess for my break room, um, most people are more concerned or about the research skills and the interpersonal skills, and uh, which means more, maybe those the most pressing ones. But of course, all of the ideas items that were listed are much more important. Think of communication skills, communicating. Uh, remains one of the most critical things mm. that especially students tend to, to encounter uh, difficulties. Mm -hmm. Communicating out problems, communicating out ideas. Yep. Students may be um, having ideas, but communicating it to the supervisor, communicating it to the mentor becomes a problem. That can mm. Yeah, thank you for that, Una. So um, communication uh, is actually one of the, the bigger things that we highlight in one of our modules, which um, I'll, be, I'll be talking about briefly, but thank you for sharing that. Um, the, the importance is communicate, of communication is definitely um, huge. And yes, as Tina mentioned, if you wanna type in the chat, feel free to do so. We have time for maybe one more person uh, to share from, from what they uh, discussed in their breakout groups. Feel free to use that chat as well. Well, I'm gonna go share and break out the monotony of the silence. Uh, and <laughs> Thank the, you. <laughs> and the psych and the psychosocial skills, I like help motivate me. I like to be motivated. Mm -hmm. give, mm. give me some exciting um, that you find that you love. Might be something I might like. Um, nutrition to just discuss nutrition of course it's a boring subject then you say guess what i found out about nutrition how magnesium would do great for your headaches and oh and did you know that avocados can do all this to your skin so it makes you hey i didn't know that i'm excited so i'm motivated to know more and i what, what else you got going mm -hmm. there you go yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that, Yolanda. That that psychosocial aspect, again, just so important, right? Um, Yolanda, like you mentioned, just having that motivation, that that excitement, um, just getting you pumped up about the work that you're doing, the research that you're doing, showing you how it connects to other pieces, uh, really bringing it together. I love that. Um, thank you so much uh, for sharing, uh, both of you, Yolanda and, and Unius. 
Uh, this is a worksheet that you should feel free to download and use for yourselves. It's a great tool, I find, whenever you are starting a new mentorship relationship or um, reassessing a mentorship relationship to really think about, well, which, which are my needs right now from this particular mentor? And then how can I communicate those needs uh, to prospective mentors or to current mentors to say, hey, let's run through this list. Which ones can you um, can you help me out with and which ones should I be finding other mentors for? So great, amazing. I um, love that you engaged with this and hopefully it was helpful. Um, and if you have any questions about the worksheet or want me to, to help you work through some of these, I'm more than happy to if you just email me um, later. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Um, we're not gonna go over uh, all of the pieces that I had planned, because I do want to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, but one of the things that I did want to talk about was what we do when we are establishing a mentorship relationship, right? We've, we've assessed these needs. We've said, okay, this is what we want out of the mentorship relationship. Now, what do we talk about? Or, or how do I talk to someone about becoming my mentor? Uh, for those of you who haven't seen The Princess Bride, um, it's a really good movie. I recommend it. But there's this, this uh, moment um, in what is otherwise a very comical movie where uh, this man is introducing himself to, uh, to someone else that has harmed him in the past. Um, but I use his method for um, what has become a famous line uh, for introducing himself. He goes, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die is the is the line in the in the movie. I use that uh, whenever I uh, get any social anxiety around reaching out to a mentor. I need to be concrete about what it is that I'm asking for them. And so I give them my name and I say, hello, my name is Fatima Sanchez Nieto. What is my connection to that person? In this case, I give the example, I read your paper. I thought it was great. I really you know, appreciated that analysis you did. And then I set concrete expectations. Would you be available for an hour to discuss this method, right? Because a lot of times if you just show up and say to someone, hey, can you be my mentor? Then they get stressed out and they say, oh, I don't have time or I don't do this or that, right? Like, so it's very, very important to set a concrete expectation and to say, this is how I know of you. This is who I am. This is our connection. Uh, can you mentor me? And by that, I mean in this specific thing and for this much time. So it's really important when either establishing or again, reassessing um, mentorship relationships. Now you've established the mentorship relationship and you have to navigate it. Well, there's a lot of things that go into navigating a mentorship relationship. And this is part of the research that I was talking about that we do. We've basically taken the concept of managing up from the business world. Those folks that you see there helped um, develop and, and um, adapt the concept of managing up in the business world, which basically means how do you as someone who is being managed Get the most out of your manager, right? This doesn't mean that you are fully and solely responsible for the manager, because really, again, that power differential, right? Um, but how do you come prepared and how do you empower yourself with tools to be someone uh, to get the most out of the management relationship? And so we've taken that into mentorship and we've taken it across um, all of these skills that we developed originally for mentors, we flipped them on its head and developed them for mentees. Um, you can see the list there. Um, it's a lot of topics to cover. We're not going to cover them today. We just, um, that exercise you did just covers a really, really brief exercise um, out of everything in the entire curriculum that we have. Um, but we talk about these things, right? Uh, like like Unius mentioned, the, the, the effect of communication. How do I communicate with uh, my mentor? Um, the, the thing about motivation that Yolanda mentioned, that comes into our, um, um, where is it? Uh, there's another one called promoting self-efficacy, right? How does my manager or my mentor keep me excited about what I'm doing and, and let me know that I can do it and that I am capable of doing? So this is, this is an entire eight-hour course that we do. Um, I'm not here to sell you anything uh, because we actually offer, I offer some of these for, for free and I support folks with, with the work that they do. And excuse me, that was my teacup. The entire curriculum is available for free on the Simmer website, which will include um, on, um, on the, on the follow-up email. Uh, so what you can do is you can 
sign up for free to, to that website because we need to track the downloads. Or you can email me and say, Fatu, I'm, I'm interested in just this one module or this one piece. And I can send you all the activities because we have them available um, as, as open resource for, for people to use as, as they need. Um, so just to say that this, this one little bit that we talked about, um, establishing a mentorship relationship, assessing your needs as a mentee, effectively communicating them with mentors. How do I introduce myself to a new mentor? These are all skills that you can develop to empower yourself um, to have more agency in your career development, whether you're an undergrad, like I heard there were some undergrads here in, in, in the breakout groups, all the way to, you know, a senior manager, you can use these skills to both um, get the most out of your management relationships, as well as the people that you may at one point manage um, in, in your life. And one of those things that's really, really important is the way to align those expectations, that's another one of the modules that we talk about. And we really talk about mentorship compacts in that. Now, we won't have time to talk about those uh, so that we can have time to, to get to questions. But I just wanted to let you know that we'll be including um, the link to an example of what is known as a mentorship compact, uh, or in this case, a management compact, if you're not in academia and you want to call it that. It's not so much a contract as it is a worksheet that you use when you want people to get together and discuss openly what the needs are. So again, you go back to that worksheet, you look and you see, well, these are the needs that I have for you as my mentor. And then your mentor says, well, I can offer you these things, or this is where I can support, and this is where I can't support. And then you have a document that tracks that. And so you can revisit that as the relationship evolves or changes, or you can revisit that if, if there's questions about how effective the relationship is being. Having something written on paper can be really, really useful. And we'll be sending you the example um, of one of these compacts and uh, um, a link to, to more so that you can look at it and see if maybe those might be helpful for you when you're discussing um, new mentorship relationships or new management relationships with, with, your, with your supervisors. That brings me to time. I really want to hear from you. I want to answer some questions. Um, I'll just put at the end here on some other useful re resources. If you're in academia and, and considering a PhD, Hello PhD uh, is a great podcast. So is Building Up the Nerve uh, from NIH and INDS. Uh, I have the Twitter bird on here. This is a bit of a dated slide. Um, I used to rely a lot on Twitter for my own scientific professional development. Um, but you also have Dragonfly Mental Health, which is a great, great resource. And this, this sun and, and cloud below, it's called PhD Balance, uh, which is talking about mental health and academic environments. Both of these are. Uh, again, these are more academic focused, um, but we can link you to those as well in the, in the follow-up email. This is me again. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you found the one exercise that we did useful. Uh, hopefully I can answer some of your questions in the next eight to, to 10 minutes. Uh, and then on the bottom left here, that's my current supervisor and incredible mentor, uh, Christine Fund, who is an expert on mentorship herself um, and was on that uh, report that I was talking about. And I owe a lot of what I know to, to her. Uh, so thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and yeah, we can uh, hand it, I'll hand it back over to Tina. And if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or come off mute and we can, uh, we can get to, to your questions. All right. Thank you so much, Fatima. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, and come off mute, or you can type in the chat, um, and Renee will um, kind of help us moderate that. Yes, absolutely. If anyone's got any questions, please unmute yourself and ask, or like Dr. Wu said, you can put those in the chat as well. Oh, I see a hand up here. You can go right ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Favor OGK, master's student at Purdue University. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you said it's usually not um, ideal to approach someone to, you know, request the person to be your mentor. Um, you can introduce yourself and ask the person or rather tell the person your expectations. So my question is, if the person gets to like, um, meet the certain expectation, 
will the person really see himself or herself as a mentor to you? Like, at mm. what point will you say that, okay, this is my mentor or will the person be your mentor, but the person mm. not knowing that he or she has the title of a mentor to you? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, thank you for asking that. And I'm, I'm sad that I didn't have enough time to, to go through that slide a little bit uh, more slowly. Um, what I meant by, by not asking someone to just be your mentor is without any clear expectations. So I, I don't certainly, um, I, I think it is okay for you to go up and to say to someone, hey, I would appreciate you being my mentor. Or I need a mentor in this area. Um, I think it's important to be concrete on your end as to what those expectations are and what a mentor means to you. Uh, because like I said, mentorship has so many different connotations and has so many different um, meanings to people that like you said exactly, you can have both situations. You either go up and say to someone, hey, I want you to be my mentor and you have one idea and they have one idea. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you develop this fantastic informal relationship with someone and you're left with this question, are you my mentor? Do you see yourself in that role for me? Um, are we just friends, colleagues? Are you someone who's giving me advice um, every so often? So it's not that I don't think you should go up and ask people be my mentor. Um, I think that when you say I would like a mentor or I think you would be a good mentor for me, it's important to follow that up with a concrete um, uh, expectation of what you mean by that and see if that person um, is open to and can provide you that type of mentorship. Uh, does that answer your question, Favor? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Good. I'm glad. Um, we've got time for a few more. I might ask a question while folks are thinking or typing. Um, you you mentioned the example um, of, uh, could you explain this one concept further? Do you have any more suggestions like that of ways to make that um, approach, uh, specific questions, specific ways to ask people to mentor you that's not, like you mentioned, so broad? Yeah, I mean, so for example, I'll give you an example. I, I have a, a writing mentor who's been my writing mentor. And now actually I consider her my really close friend for over 15 years. Um, and at the time my ask was, uh, you know, hey, I wrote this short story, I think. We connected over something else, but then I found out she was a writer and I said, hey, I have this short story. Would you be willing to look at it, right? Um, so there's very sort of clear career development needs that can show up similar to the ones that we saw um, on the on the sheet. So I have this paper that I need to submit. Would you mind looking at it? Or I really like um, the work that you're doing. Can you point me to other uh, references or key papers in this area? So those are very concrete ones. Um, there are also some some life ones um, or or identity ones that, that can be important. So for example, me, um, asking some folks uh, in the academy who are transgender and who are, uh, you know, in a position that I want to be in uh, to say, hey, look, you're the only person here who understands this aspect of who I am, or someone who is Latinx, for example, uh, who I can go up and say, hey, how have you found managing and navigating this aspect of your identity with the academy, um, or this part of navigating your work and your life? Uh, so there's quite a few, I think, concrete things that come up, and they don't all necessarily relate to career. They can be psychosocial as well. And some of the more fruitful um, and, and uh, supportive mentorship relationships can come from people who aren't necessarily advising you on a particular field of science, um, but who are supporting you just you know, in general with, with your career or where you're going. Um, and they don't even have to be from a higher career stage, right? Peer mentoring um, is something that you can do with folks at your same career level where you're both supporting each other in, in that way. Oh, that's great. That's super helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's definitely time for a few more questions if anyone else wants to unmute themselves.
and I'll say I'm very I'm I'm a teacher. Um, Tina is too. We went through the same teaching uh, course together. We're very comfortable with with uh, with the silence and just letting people think and and process. So um, we can give you a few more minutes to to see if any questions come up. Um, uh, most times in a uh, grad school, uh, students do consider their supervisors as their mentors, and even when asked who is the mentor in this, they will point out their advisors. And, uh, the journey of mentorship is normally um disturbed by the nature of relationship that they may have in different areas of their working be it's uh, the student may be doing well in the lab but doing poor in the field and uh, when it comes to um um the day-to-day -day, um a working relationship you find it it's disturbed because the student is not doing well in some areas and uh, so in such kind of, of situation, what kind of advice can you have to a student is not having um, a, 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 maybe in areas of interpersonal skills, how to handle such kind of conflict with advisors, how to deal with the other workmates, other labmates, um, workmates in the field, technicians, Yes, yeah, so what kind of advice can you have to such kind of study? And I think it is common because you'll find you'll meet um, uh, in a group of five students, you'll find one who is complaining that mm -hmm. is not doing well with uh, um, either rabbits or um, technicians or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. You were cutting off a bit, but if I get that right, um, I believe you're asking about. Um, what happens there was it seemed like two parts what happens when you have um a student being mentored well in one area but lacking in other areas and then you also asked about what happens when you've got some sort of interpersonal conflict or difficulties with different people correct yes yeah so for the first one i i would say um this is where the mentor networks come in and in particular i think is for um for a student, if they're struggling in this way, to look either to the um, head of their program or to someone in the department who uh, is like a student's affair person uh, to say, I need this type of mentorship. I'm not getting it from my mentor. Hopefully that conversation is one they feel comfortable having with their mentor and saying, hey, I'm struggling in this area. You're really busy. Can we find co-mentors for me? Um, so that we can we can expand my mentor network and so that I can you know uh, improve in these areas. Now, when you have conflict, that tends to be a little bit more difficult. Interpersonal conflict in the lab, I think, is the responsibility of the supervisor. Um, and where that fails, then that's something that needs to be considered by the person who is experiencing the conflict in the lab. Um, and and um, conflict with their supervisors is, is, is an even more complicated thing because of those power dynamics that I talked about. And it will depend on um, the different systems and structures that are in place, uh, right, whether it's in the workplace or in or in the academy and uh, and in their local department. What I would say for for students, you know, as as a broad thing um, for students experiencing conflict with their supervisor um, is to consider other alternatives, i.e., do I have an exit strategy? What happens if this gets to that point? Um, how can I find other sources of support while I am going through the situation? Um, and overall, how can I strengthen my support network so that I can get uh, some level of, of emotional support while I'm going through a difficult situation and potentially start building a network so that I can transfer out of that situation um, if, if possible? Uh, but that's a really complex question. I'm glad you asked it, though, because it's the reason why I got into this field in the first place. Uh, you can see a little bit more about it if you if you watch my TED talk. But that's actually the passion that drives this. Um, I think that brings us to time, though, right, Renee?
Yes, perfectly so the thank time. You <laughs> You're welcome, Eunice. Hopefully that helped. And Yolanda, I see yours in the <laughs> chat. Um, I'll try to get to yours briefly. It sounds sure. similar. I was asking the same similar question anyway. I do see a lot of overlap, definitely, between those situations. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask uh, Tina or Dwayne to pull up that slide um, because we do have a survey that y'all are able to um, take just to give us a little bit more information um, about these sessions and make them better for you. I very much want to thank uh, Dr. Sanchez and Nieto for speaking. Beautiful speak. I'm very or speech. I'm very excited to hear that TED Talk and read those additional resources. Um, like she mentioned during the talk, we are going to be emailing those out um, to attendees and those who registered. So, um, and we'll also post a recording of this link, um, and that's going to be available on our uh, partner website. Additionally, we have one more session coming up that's scheduled for February 23rd, which is going to be Branding You, and the link to that is also posted in the chat. Um, also in the chat are our email addresses if you have follow-up questions um, as well for uh, Dr. Fatima, her email is there as well. Um, so I we would like to thank you all so much for attending to um, this evening. And we hope to see you back on February 23rd for our final session of the winter, <laughs> winter session that we have scheduled. Um, and thank you so much again to everyone for participating. We really, really appreciate you all so much. Thank you all. This was great.